All right, um, Sam. Hello. You're on. So actually, oh, I was us, I was yeah. given the honor of introducing Hi, Sam this evening, and um, I'm going to introduce you to him in two ways. Number one, I'm going to share with you from his bio, um, Sam Richardson, Master of Divinity, PhD in Sociology, calls himself a traditional Jewish guy who also happens to be a sociologist. He's been involved with a variety of small Jewish communities across this country, including in Colorado, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Virginia. In addition to serving as the director of small community, small community outreach for the Jewish National Fund, Sam's ongoing research seeks to increase the understanding of how small Jewish communities engage in the task of transmitting Jewish values to the next generation, thereby facilitating Jewish continuity and strengthening connections to Israel. In getting to know him over this past year and working with small communities, I'd like to say he's a highly likable guy with significant intellectual achievement, a diverse background, a variety of interests, strong family connections and values, and has a passion for the work he does with JNF as the director of small communities. Sam, it's your floor. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that very warm introduction. Oh, host participant screen sharing is disabled. <laughs> uh, let me fix that for you. I'm gonna make you a co-host, so at the end of your presentation, don't end the meeting. I, I promise I won't. Okay. Okay. Here we go, do you see that? We do. Okay, great. So again, thank you, Nancy, for that wonderful introduction. Erev Tov, everybody, thank you for allowing me to share with you this evening uh, regarding our affiliates rocket response, as well as a little bit about JNF small communities. To start right in, I'd like to give you some details of the before and after situation two weeks ago in the Gaza envelope. And this is the map of what we consider to be the Gaza envelope, the area outside of Gaza and in Israel and north of Egypt. And it all started, of course, August 2nd, 5 a.m. What happened at that date and time? Well, the IDF arrested one of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad leaders. And then the Gaza envelope went into silent lockdown, silent tension, as is the official term. All of Karen Shalom went into lockdown. People were not allowed to leave. They were not told why. Roads were blocked from Halutza all the way north. And you may have seen Yadidi Harusha's update um, Thursday, it said, the roads are blocked, we can't leave, we don't know why, something's going on, please pray for us. And that, you know, that's when we started to get a little nervous. Some of the educational activities, a lot of routines were halted, of course, during summer holidays, that so makes it difficult on everybody. And interestingly, also, I mean, it would make sense, but another thing that told me there's a problem is that there were no trains from Ashkelon South, which is off this map, but going south. There were no trains. And then on August the 5th, 4 p.m. local time, the beginning of Operation Breaking Dawn. The evacuation of Shah Negev residents started Friday evening, and then about 1,800 residents left the area either independently or with the regional council's organized evacuation plan. And then of course, the IDF set to work battling those who would cause us harm. Then our affiliates responded. They were meeting consistently together and with the regional councils during and after the crisis. Their communication was very excellent and they were able to provide 200 beds from Mus, 80 beds from Shomer HaChadash. The Aquatic Center hosted 60 families. Macomb sent people into the area, into harm's way to provide games and programs for adults and kids, people of all ages. 
Ayalon, Lotem, Ammunition Hill, they were open for free and transportation was provided by our affiliates to people who needed transportation. As Shoch Mitzman, the Armakom liaison said, it's unfortunate, but we know how to respond well in a crisis. And that was a tough time, but they made it through. They were very successful. And now it's time to look at our future state. And as I was talking to our affiliates uh, over the past several days, one thing that they all agreed on is that we are not 911. There are state and, and regional council resources to provide those emergency services. However, we have a strong and resilient network and that's how we respond is through our network. The regional councils have resiliency plans and we will and have been working with them to integrate where possible. Keeping in mind that situations are dynamic. A comprehensive strategy takes all possible variables into account. But again, since we're not 911, we do not and we are not expected to account for all possible variables. Rather, we focus on our strengths, fire and rescue, bomb shelters, resilience centers. That's where our strengths lie and that's where we're moving. And we've demonstrated that we have been preparing or in 2017 during that configuration, our response was much less because we didn't have the fire and rescue uh, in place. We didn't have as many bomb shelters to provide for quick safety. And then last year during that time, we were not as prepared as we were this year. So we continue to grow in preparedness every year and we're able to do a little more and a little more within our focus areas. And as Eric Nero, our Israel communications officer said, the most important time to support the Gaza envelope is after the most recent emergency and before the next one. The Gaza envelope success this year and prior years is due to long-term vision, continuous work, not immediate response. So they're going to be planning and we need to put our efforts into making sure they have the, the resources they need to focus on our strengths. Any questions on this section? And I, I, I can't see you, so just talk away if you do. Quiet on this front, Sam. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that was helpful. If you do have any questions, feel free to, to write me at any time, srichardson at jnf.org. So something that is much more pleasant to talk about, <laughs> small communities, the new frontier in Jewish community outreach growth, supporting Israel. As you know, JNF is more than trees, right? Well, we're also more than cities. I grew up in Grand Junction, not Denver. So I, I grew up knowing that I was not in a city. Jaina provides a voice for our partners, lay leaders, staff who live and work beyond our large Jewish centers. And although the phrase American Jewish community often brings to mind places like Miami, New York, LA, there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish Americans who live in places like Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Again, Grand Junction, Colorado, Eugene, Oregon, Savannah, Georgia. In fact, there are over 380 Jewish communities in the United States with fewer than 5,000 people. And many of them have been around for 135 years, some for 200, more than 200 years. The Jewish community in, in Charlottesville, near where I live today, has been around since the founding of the United States. There's different levels of what it means to be a small community. And I'm gonna get a little bit of definition added, but I just want you to know that there's around 56 in the magic small area between 1,000 and 3,000. And then there's 76 uh, communities between 3,000 and 5,000, and they're in all 50 states. There's no state that doesn't have a small Jewish community the, the way I've defined it here. And sometimes a small community may be found in a large city. So for example, Indianapolis, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, not small cities, you know, you're talking still half a million people, and but then the Jewish community is less than 5,000. So a small Jewish community is speaking of that Jewish community, not what may be a metro area. Now what's different about those of us living in small Jewish community is that it's really 
a different experience. It's, you know, it's easy to be Jewish in a large city in that you can disappear if you want. You don't have to go to the kosher pizza place. You can go to Domino's or wherever you like. And if you're going across town or on your way home from work or whatever, you don't necessarily gonna run into anybody who not only knows you, but knows that you're Jewish and says, oh, well, you're representing the Jewish community. Why are you getting pepperoni on your pizza? However, in small communities, especially if you're in a small community and a small Jewish community where your kids are going to school with Christians and they know you're Jewish and the teacher invites you in to do the annual presentation on Hanukkah every year because you're the parent who can talk about these things, you are on all the time. And it, what it does, it actually creates a stronger aggregate Jewish identity for all age groups in that community, which as a Jewish sociologist is a very good thing, but it also means it makes Jewish life different and in some ways more difficult. And, and so, as I say, we do Judaism differently than our city cousins. Now, while we do Judaism a bit differently, our passion for Israel, of course, is just as deep. And we are proud to add our voice to the larger voice of the Jewish National Fund and the larger Zionist voice. I've come up with this phrase, thinking small. And this concept of thinking small can be classified into four different groups, leveraged by parents and leaders of a community of any size, really. The first one is don't rely on large institutions or professional class. Basically, think for yourself, make sure you understand why you're doing what you're doing and understand your, your goals and your foundations as you move through the, the years and the decades and planning for those next generations. Therefore, you're going to need to reduce outsourcing by increasing parental and personal responsibility. Now, in our smaller communities, that's a necessity in and of itself because there's simply not the funds in order to hire a staff of Jewish professionals. It's fascinating, though, in some, some larger communities where they realized this and they said, you know, we're going to reduce the number of Jewish professionals and we are going to ask our parents and even our singles and our college students to step up and take more responsibility. And it's amazing the changes that come about. Thinking small means clarifying and articulating community values. So they're very, very clear. And finally, because you have clear values, we're not afraid to set and clarify boundaries, which encourage living by our community values. So my findings, this is based on my research, indicate that when these principles are leveraged in any community, the strength of Jewish identity increases at the individual level, the community level, there's higher affinity with Israel, children are more likely to return to their roots in their late 20s than are their peers who come from communities which don't employ these principles. And something many people don't realize is that as large as the Jewish National Fund is, one of the secrets to our success is thinking small, meeting the needs of individuals and families and communities in Israel. Well, I, I told you I'd, I'd answer the question a little bit. I'll go through this fairly quickly. There's basically three types of small communities for JNF purposes. The first is the type which clearly falls within the small community portfolio, a standalone community, meaning it's not near any major metropolitan area and less than 5,000 Jewish individuals. Or a community of maybe more than 5,000 Jewish individuals, but there's no JNF presence and there's either not a strong federation or it's a federation that wants our help and is very willing to work with us to provide Israel connections. And third, communities with fewer than 5,000 individuals may be near a large metropolitan area, but they have an identity separate from the city. And the local and regional JNF staff don't envision working with that community in any way. And so they say, Sam, please help us out. The second type is a community that does not fall within our portfolio. And they're part of a larger metropolitan area, which maybe they do, maybe they don't have a separate identity, maybe they're a commuter town, but for JNF purposes and for the staff purposes in that area, they're part of the larger city. And finally, communities where we are collaborating, that a small community is near a metropolitan area, has a separate identity, but the local staff don't see a benefit of working in context with the metro area, and but they're willing to work with me. And, and that, of course, increases the resources that I have 
to do outreach to that community. And that's not unlike working with Mountain States as we are utilizing Barbara and Nancy to go out to Northern and Southern Colorado, which is a great thing. And speaking of Barbara and Nancy, we have this whole team in place. It's not big enough, um, but we have it here. Um, we got our COE director. He's been out for about a year. Ben Cook, he's fabulous. And our brand new iPad, Dove Gordon. He has tons of energy and he's right now staffing a alternative break trip in Israel. And then we have our whole small communities committee plus our two associate members that you know. And also I need you to know we are recruiting new members. We need people who are willing to get down into the weeds doing community outreach within one of these 300, community, 300 plus communities across the country. And it's anybody who wants to get to know small communities, is from a small community, currently lives in a small community, has relatives in a small community, whatever it is. If they're willing to help us reach these people who don't know us from trees, please let me know. And finally, Jane of Small Communities is about you because we need you on our team in any way that you're able to, even if it's just joining our, our Facebook page, keeping up with how we are connecting to Israel as small communities and also our brand new Twitter feed. We've only got about a dozen tweets out there, but they seem to be fairly popular. So please find us on Twitter as well. Any questions? A couple of questions, Sam. <clears throat> when, we, when you show that slide of the small communities, they're all over the country. Yes. Are you, are you asking us to travel to those small communities to connect uh, with them? The way, the, way, the way we work is that um, our committee members adopt a community. Ideally, they adopt a community that's close by, but sometimes they might have uh, I, one of our members, uh, for, by way of an example, um, Ron Solomon, he is in Cincinnati, but he's adopted Louisville, which is, it's in his general region, but it's still an hour away just like Nancy and Barbara going to um, Fort Collins or to Colorado Springs. It's, it's a drive, but it's doable. And so we're not asking people to go cross country, but whatever's comfortable for them to take on the task. Does that answer your question? Really Anything nice. else? <laughs> what, what do you have the people do? We have... That's a great question, thank you. And basically it's a, it's a three-step process. Again, because most of these communities don't know JNF from trees, if at all. And so the first thing is we take our data, list from the database and we say, let's, let's call people and just let them know, we know they're there, thank you for the trees they've bought or maybe they gave in honor of a, of a, of a life cycle event or they're part of a, maybe even a Dream Israel fundraising campaign and ask them about the community what their level of Israel awareness is generally in the community, get to know them, how can we help them with their personal Israel connections and, and just find out who's in the community. Second, to network, understand, are the clergy the ones that are the power players in this community or are they lay leaders that are the power players in the community? Who in the community is really has their thumb on the pulse of what is important priority wise in the community? because we're looking towards number three to plan an event and to plan an event that's gonna be meaningful, we need to know the personality of this community. And so it takes us a few months to come to that point where we think we know the personality well enough that we can plan an event, a parlor meeting, we've talked to enough people, we know who is going to be amenable to hosting it in their home, how many people we can expect to attend, what kind of capacity there might be, and then we hold the event. And so that's um, from soup to nuts, and in very brief, what we're asking people to do. Are you trying to identify other small communities in Colorado? I mean, besides Colorado Springs and uh, where did you say? Um, Fort, Fort Collins. Collins. I mean, these are big, play, big towns. <clears throat> what about the small places? Grand Junction, maybe? Absolutely, Tim absolutely. I would love for somebody to adopt Grand Junction. That would just make <laughs> me smile all day long. Uh, <laughs> That would be great. Also Jackson Hole, Wyoming, there's a small community. Um, also going down into Albuquerque, uh, there's a small community. So there, there's a number of opportunities out there 
uh, for, for outreach in your general area. <laughs> okay. All right, Sam, well, we're going, thank you so much. And Nancy, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. So.